Hello, St. Peter's and friends. We hope you're staying safe and healthy, and we're glad to be worshiping with you today. And now, we'd like to share a few announcements. Please excuse the dust around our church campus as renovations for our Widen Our Welcome, or WOW campaign, continue. And what looks a little disheveled right now will soon be fresh and put together in an effort to widen our welcome for many seasons to come. Join our Monday evening Zoom Bible study titled Simply Jesus, the Gospel According to Mark, which runs from 7 to 8 p.m. This class is ongoing, so you may join any Monday, and we assure you every discussion is enlightening. Contact Bruce Wilcox to receive your Zoom invitation at brucewilcox6 at gmite.com. Next Sunday, September 5th, make sure you bring a picnic lunch and a blanket or chairs and plan to stay after worship for a time of fellowship on the lawn. There'll be lawn games such as Bing Bag Toss, Giant Jenga, and Spike Ball. Enjoy the last Sunday of summer with your St. Peter's family. Our Stephen Minister Training begins on September 18th. Stephen Ministry has had a significant and meaningful impact in countless lives in our community. Stephen Ministers provide one-to-one Christian-centered care to our people in our congregation and community who are experiencing difficult times. If you are someone that feels a call to serve others with a trained, listening ear, please reach out to Anna Suttoth via email at anna at spbts.org to get more information about training and serving as a Stephen minister. Our fall training class will meet Wednesday nights for two months and will include two day retreats. All materials are provided. And you are invited to join us the weekend of September 11th and 12th. We are having a Brahms Requiem concert at St. Peter's on Saturday, September 11th at 4 p.m., directed by Jeannie Cobb. An RSVP is required to attend the concert. Then on Sunday, September 12th, please join us as we will begin indoor, in-person worship with live feed for those who wish to continue to worship online from home. Please invite your family and friends to both gatherings. All are welcome. Watch for invitations and details coming soon. And now, from wherever you are, join us as we begin our worship service together.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. We here at St. Peter's by the Sea are so glad that you are here with us. Thank you for coming to worship with us. Your presence during this online service means so much to us. You are precious in our sight, and we all thank you so much for joining us. God loves you, and so do we here at St. Peter's by the Sea. Welcome and enjoy. Come set your rule and in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Cause we are your church. We need your power. God, that is who you 
The prophet Jeremiah writes, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. In humility and in faith, and with our individual and collective heart, I invite you to join me in praying our prayer of confession, printed on your screen and in your bulletins. Gracious Lord, you have blessed us with freedom, freedom to follow or turn away, freedom to love or to hate, freedom to heal or to hurt. You ask only that we follow your ways, loving our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us when we walk in ways other than yours, in the midst of our turbulent lives and this broken world. Help us to be repairers of the breach, committed to the hard work of reconciliation, believing that we all can begin again. In these next moments, hear our confessions we offer to you in silence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Harvest the fruit of the Spirit, freely given by God, and share it freely with others. Know that you are loved and forgiven. Trust that you are treasured, now and always. Friends, the good news of the gospel is this. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I was pondering this week about how I was raised by what I call a Central Valley work ethic. You never complain. You work hard. You barely use air conditioning. You serve quietly. You give what you can, and you only take what you need. In God's humorous way, I've been married to a man that also has a set of values. Give generously, trust God's will, that He will meet you in that generosity, think of others and their needs, and be lavish in your giving. These values were intention from the beginning of our marriage. I thought mine were better. But as with God and His mysterious ways, it didn't have to be either or. It could be both and. My heart has been changed and softened many times over these 25 years of marriage. And when I thought we had to hold tight to what we had and that scarcity was the final word. I have finally grown over time and been changed. Transformed, as it says in the scripture. That generosity and giving more than seems reasonable or prudent, as I was raised, is also how God changes us. Giving part of our income to God reminds me that it was never mine to hold tightly to and that somehow in God's economy, giving lavishly and generously heals my heart. It heals my heart of those fears of scarcity, that there won't be enough, and it frees me to trust the Lord with my life. It's an ongoing hard work in my life, but I do it daily. Jesus says in Matthew 10, the realm of heaven has come near. Freely you have received, therefore freely, friends, 
we give. Let us offer our lives up to God. Good morning. Today is the eighth of nine sermons taking us through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatians. We've been focusing on Paul's theme of freedom throughout this letter and in particular how his words challenge and encourage us with a freedom to begin again. The thing about freedom that God would have for us 
is that if we open our hearts, empty our hands, and receive the freedom, the blessings that God promises us, with those blessings, they begin to expand and overflow into our lives. From our life together and into this world that God so deeply loves. The blessings don't run out. Let's listen to what the Apostle Paul says today. Beginning in chapter 5, verse 1 and verses 16 through 26. Hear now the word of our God. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. I'm warning you, as I've warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray for the reading and hearing of God's Word. God, we ask your blessing on Paul as he preaches. We ask that our hearts would be softened to the ways you want to teach us through your Word, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this space set apart for us to meditate and think about all the ways you love us. In your name, amen. Well, good morning. It is always a gift to gather in this way, in this space, around the Word of God together. I want to say thank you to Devin for that scripture reading. Many of you know that Devin is my wife and my better half. Um, Devin has always been someone who holds the Word of God very close to her heart. In fact, um, I remember back to our high school years. One of the first times I met her, she had her Bible in her hand. And um, I just remember it was a really worn Bible for someone our age. And it turned out it was worn because she read it a lot and she underlined and highlighted. And, and so the Word of God has always meant something um, deep to Devon and, and um, its application for her and for this world that God so deeply loves. And so thank you, um, Devon, for your reading and your prayers. I love you. You know, we have arrived at sermon number eight in a series of nine sermons taking us through the Apostle Paul's letter um, through the book of Galatians this summer. The freedom to begin again. 
That's the theme that we have um, titled this series. And we've been talking about this theme of Christian liberty, Christian freedom. And it is a theme that the Apostle Paul discusses in many of his letters in the latter part of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul's story was one where he himself experienced freedom in Christ. Freedom from a kind of oppression that he had really bought into himself, um, brought unto himself. And so he can seem rather impatient, even um, angry at times, when it comes to matters of Christian freedom. I think it's because um, of his own experience. You know, he knows that um, life really doesn't go very far um, without living into and receiving and embodying um, the fullness of freedom in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, which is another um, one of Paul's letters, there is a, a wonderful line where he says this. He writes, Creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. So that's not want want part. You know, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. In essence, what Paul is saying is that by our very identity, that God has given us in Jesus Christ, we are set free. The great late theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer um, was known for saying, we are set free for something much more than we are freed from something. Now, if you spend any amount of time reading the Apostle Paul, you'll soon discover that um, he loves lists, lists of all sorts of things. And when we read these lists, I think we can easily imagine him dictating these lists, sort of liking the sound of his own voice, repeating a number of things that sort of elucidate, um, raise up a singular theme. And the more familiar um, we become with these lists, fruit of the Spirit, case in point, the more familiar we become with these lists, the more they kind of stumble off our tongues. And they can almost become things that we try to protect or enshrine. Um, we try to unpack and pick apart the details and the nuance of what each word means. But the lists... The lists are really about making um, one big point. And we see that in the two lists that are in the passage that Devin just read for us this morning. One list that in some ways describes the decay that Paul speaks about in that line from Romans 8 that I just read to you. And there's another list describing the glorious freedom, the glorious liberty, also from that line in Romans 8. The lists of the works of the flesh, and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, these two lists have got me thinking of lists in general, and so my thoughts sort of immediately turn to to-do lists, right? We all make them. We all have different abilities in keeping them, of accomplishing them. We all have different abilities in even being able to locate them after we've made them, right? <laughs> Guilty. But these to-do lists kind of give us focus. They set goals. They dispatch things that need doing. They help us to achieve goals we aspire to accomplish. To-do lists can be very effective tools. And it's made me think of other kinds of lists as well. One literary example that a friend reminded me of this past week are some famous lists of a Charles Dickens character in A Tale of Two Cities, Madame Defarge. She made lists. She made lists of atrocities committed by the aristocrats. And the interesting way that she made her lists is that she actually knitted them um, into code. As she witnessed horrible abuses of power being perpetrated by the aristocrats, she would um, record their names, right? And their abuse committed in the encoded stitches in her knitting. 
And later on in, in the book, Charles Dickens um, tells of Madame Defarge standing near the guillotine as heads are locked off, and she would rip the stitches out, calling out the names and, uh, of, of the perpetrators and the atrocities, the crimes. And as she did so, she would get rid of her list of these errant aristocrats. Well, obviously, that is a ruthless, that was a ruthless focus that Madame Defarge had, a kind of strange to-do list that, that addressed injustices and made way for retribution and reprisal. It was a, a gradual but a very focused attempt to eradicate a system, a social system, that was perceived to be the source of all these wrongs. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, you know, Paul, that is a bit of a stretch for us to relate to. But is it? It's pretty easy to go down a rabbit hole of injustice in unjust ways. To-do lists like these rarely accomplish the big goal that they set out to achieve. The aristocrats may disappear, but the darkness of the human heart remains unchanged. You know, sometimes when I read the Apostle Paul's words here in Galatians 5, I can interpret them as to-do lists. And I'm sure that many of us have heard Galatians, the sermons on Galatians 5 that basically tell us, well, you shouldn't do this and you absolutely should do this. You shouldn't do the works of the Spirit and you absolutely should do, the, I mean, you shouldn't do the works of the flesh, excuse me, and you absolutely should do the works or the fruit of the Spirit. But these two lists in the context of the book of Galatians aren't really meant to be prohibitive or prescriptive. You see, they are not really to-do lists at all. They're not prohibitive or prescriptive. They're descriptive of a reality. They describe an outcome of two very different ways of, of ordering our lives. It's yet another example of a theme that, that Paul has been exploring um, with throughout his, this letter, a question that he's asking us to work with, and that question is this, will we order life according to matters of the flesh or matters of the Spirit of God? Will we base life on our striving and our control, or will we relate faith to the grace of God? And the key to understanding both of these lists, and the key to understanding both of these lists, I think, is found in a statement that Paul makes at the end of the second list. And I have to confess, I have to, you know, be honest here, that usually I am so focused, hyper-focused on the lists when reading this passage and unpacking the lists that I've missed the forest for the trees. There is no law against such things. That's the last part of verse 23. There is no law against these things. And so, there we go. There is no law against the fruit of the Spirit. There's no reason to create laws against any of the things that are listed on the fruit of the Spirit. But sometimes... You have to consider the trees to appreciate the forest. So let's consider for a moment the lists. Lists that describe the difference between an unredeemed and a transformed life. List one, it refers to works of the flesh. And these are the things against which we make laws. It is a kind of random, a haphazard list of the, 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 the fruit of selfishness, if you will. 
And it talks about sexuality expressed without respect and love. Paul calls these things fornication, impurity, licentiousness. It talks about religion where we create or seek to manipulate our own gods. Paul names this idolatry and sorcery. It talks about letting nothing but our own affections and perceptions and comforts govern our relationships with one another. And Paul fleshes this out with words like enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy. And it talks about addictions that can become our gods and govern our view of reality. And he names these things as drunkenness and carousing. Again, it, 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 it may be an equation where we say, you know, well, that applies to me or that doesn't. But I think there is application of these works of the flesh all around us right here, right now in the world in which we live. All around us because when life is, is, is rooted in a view of life where it is all about us, what we can control, um, what is comfortable to us, what our preferences are. I think when life is focused through that lens, then things go south. When there's nothing bigger that orders life, nothing bigger that knits us together, then our own, then our own preferences or securities and comforts and affections and trying to achieve them then those things become a god or gods, and what results is brokenness and chaos. And so Paul says, I think it's important to note that at the end of, of this works of the flesh list, um, he says this, he says, we won't find God at the end of any of these roads. You know, I've been thinking a lot about that because I think we might find God along the road with us, trying to redirect us and walk with us and hold us. But Paul tells us we won't find God at the end of those roads because those roads do not lead us to the road of the kingdom of God. Which brings us to the second list, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit against which there is no law. Now, something I always, I've always loved about the Greek text, which is the original language of the New Testament, um, something I've always loved about the Greek text of this particular passage is that the word fruit in the Greek is karpos, which is singular in the Greek. So, in essence, we do not get to pick a fruit of the moment or a fruit of the day to practice. No, they all work together. They all hang together. And there's no law against them because together they overcome and overwhelm the tendency of those works of the flesh. You see, fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, the more that it embodies us, is it, it, it becomes something that is naturally occurring, yielding, um, naturally yielding because we're rooted in the right place. Rooted in the right place. Which I think is a life empowered by, by the presence, the transforming presence of our living God. A life that is so rooted in God that it can seek none other than to be interactive and relational with God. And with this world that God so deeply loves. You know, I'm not sure why this is true, but it seems um, so easy, maybe too easy, to turn life, the life of faith, into something that is sort of a, a dour experience of avoiding things that are prohibited. And then we feel shame or guilt when we fall short and fall prey to these prohibited things. Friends, life the life that God would have for us, the abundant life that Jesus talks about and invites us to, that life isn't all about us striving to become who we know we aren't. Let me say that to you more personally. This life that Jesus invites you to isn't about you striving to try to become all that you know that you are not. 
This life, this abundant life that Jesus invites us to is about resting in the truth of who God has made us to be. Resting in the freedom of being a child of God. Because resting in that space means that we don't have to prove anything to God. What we need to do is accept God's approval of, of us. For as the Apostle Paul writes elsewhere in his letters, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. The old life has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let me say that again. If anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As some of you may know, last November, I found, I found out that my, my biological father was different than the man I have called father for my entire life. I wasn't looking for that revelation. I was simply trying to understand more of my racial ethnic background. With the discovery of my biological father, I have also discovered that I'm half Samoan. Now, I have most likely lived more than half my life to this point without knowing half of my racial ethnic identity. And yet I've always wondered, I've always probably at a deeper sense known that there was something there, which is why I took a DNA test. It has been a very emotional eight months, to say the least, and it has been a very liberating eight months. For one, my children have been my teachers. Our children, my two children, uh, are adopted, so the language of birth father is very familiar to them. When I shared my news with them, their first response was, Yay, Daddy! You have a bio daddy, too! My children have been my teachers. Secondly, over the past eight months, I have been introduced to numerous, and I mean many, biological family members, including a parent, aunts, uncles, cousins, siblings, nephews, nieces. One cousin, whom I very recently met, wrote something to me that I can't quite shake. He wrote this. He said, our family has a legacy of adopting each other. Sorry. Our family has a legacy of adopting each other. We are a diverse family, and the thing that has always held us together is love. He continued, We always hear that blood is thicker than water, but with the absence of love, blood might as well be water. Thank you for those words, Peter. They, they continue to bless me. In essence, love is a choice. It is a decision, and we know the answer to that choice because our scriptures tell us, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God, and the one who loves knows God. And so I choose love. Finally, today is my birthday. And I'm not telling you that to draw attention to me, but today is my birthday. And the reason I'm sharing is um, that given what I've shared, my birthday means something very different to me this year. It reminds me that this life isn't about being born once and then we die once and, and, and that's a wrap. <laughs> no, the life that we have been given, the life that God has given to us is a series of choices, a lifetime of choices to be born again and again and again and again. If anyone... If anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
I choose the new life that Jesus wants for me. I choose the new life that Jesus wants for us. How about you? It's not a once and done equation and thanks be to God for that and that God's mercies and God's promises are new every morning. I'll leave you with this question. Are you rooted in the right place? Because God wants fruit for our lives and for our life together, abundant fruit that is nothing less than the fullness of life for us and for all of this world that God so deeply loves. May it be so, and may we be so. Amen and amen. Please join us as we pray the prayers for you and for all the people of this world, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself doing. Just take this moment and be one in this prayer. Lord, we are grateful for sacred space where we can peacefully hear your word and consider our stories within the grand scheme of your story that is life together. May gratitude pave the way of our next chapters and also serve as a conduit for a keen ability to know and respond to the groanings of this world all the more. And so, Lord, we claim gratitude. We also cry out for help. We are sad. We are scared. We are angry. We are anxious. We are weary. We are overwhelmed. There is so much loss happening in the world right now. Oh God, oh precious God, be our refuge, God of comfort. Sustain the medical caregivers as they witness and bear consequences of the action and inaction of humanity in this ongoing pandemic. Calm the storms, still shaking the ground, Extinguish the raging fires, call back the floodwaters, satisfy the dry, cracked, and groaning earth. Carry the grieving people of Haiti who have been devastated by the earthquake and governmental unrest, Lord. Give strength to those providing medical care, rescue efforts, and aid. You are an ever-present help in trouble. Oh God, we thank you. As the light continues to go out in Lebanon, let Lebanese people feel your presence. Keep them safe. Allow their food and resources to be renewed tenfold. Oh, great peacemaker, draw near to us. Let the children in Afghanistan be protected and rescued. Guard the Afghan women and girls from what cruelty and terror only few can imagine. Hold the people of Myanmar close as their nation continues to be inundated with political chaos, murder, flooding, and sickness. Lord, even when it does not make sense to us, you call us to pray for those who persecute. We place the Taliban and the Myanmar military, each of them also a child of God, in your hands. Turn their hearts, quell their hostility, and oh God, please cease their violence. Creator of all, embolden our grief and our rage into action. Help us enter the pain of others without centering on our own. Help us engage in accountability and reparations and to compel our leaders to do the same. Soothe our weary bodies, quiet our congested minds, cradle our aching hearts, and fill our mouths with your words of wisdom. All corners of the world need your presence, peace, and healing 
right now, O oh God. Gracious Lord, renew our spirits. Remind us of your steadfast love that never ceases, that your mercies never come to an end, and that they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. For we pray this day with the disciples of long ago saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for online worship here at St. Peter's by the Sea. It is always good to worship God in this virtual space together. You know, um, I am grateful to be in community with all of you near and far. I am grateful that we create spaces where we can share life and story. And um, obviously, more of my story is going to come out as I continue to pastor and live and, 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 and do life um, with you together in our midst. So um, consider this the teaser, the beginning of, of, of sharing more as we continue to do life together. You know, as you go from this place, um, you know, you're going to probably start your day or your week tomorrow making lists, lists of things to do.
And when we think of these lists that are in the fifth chapter of, of Galatians, you know, my encouragement is this. You know, think less of the lists. You know, don't use them, the lists, as your metric for how um, well or um, how, um, you know, off the, 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 the goal, off the mark you are. And the metric that you want to, the metric that we want to use, the rule that we want to use for life, is that promise that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, a new life has begun. Friends, we have an opportunity to choose love, to choose God every single day. And we can be born again and again and again and again because God's mercies, God's promises are new every morning. And as we go from this place, may the deep love of God, the grace, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all until we meet again. Friends, go in peace to love and serve our God. And the people of God would say, that's right. Amen. Go in peace.